All right, so before we get started, um, I want to see, because I've been to a lot of these and I'm seeing a whole bunch of new faces. How many folks here, it's your first DrupalCon ever? Holy moly, congratulations. Uh, and also, big congratulations, last session, last day, you're all here. You have smiles on your faces under the masks, I'm sure. Um, and so we really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, today we're just going to be doing uh, a more kind of informal chat. Um, we've got folks up here that are, are great at what they do and they want to share their knowledge. Um, but uh, if, if throughout the time, if you have a question that you want to interject, um, let's try to make them questions so we can drive a, a conversation uh, with the panelists. But um, if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, it's the last session. We're all a bit tired, so let's make sure we, uh, we have some fun with this. So, um, and man, design systems are the thing this year. Uh, I saw a bunch of sessions uh, talking about it, and all of them had full rooms. So uh, it's, it's great to see folks actually diving into these and getting to know what they are. So uh, first off, we just want to say hello. Um, and thank you for coming. Um, I'll introduce ourselves here down at the end. Introduce ourselves, yeah, that would be yeah. me. Hi. <laughs> I'm Jonathan, um, head of technical at Cellador. Annie Lou, um, designer, web, no, web developer yep. at Cellador. Yep, and my name is Chris, uh, founder of Cellador, um, front end dev ish at times, even though they try to keep me out of it as much as they can now. So, <laughs> um, so today, we're going to be talking, I'm going to be kind of facilitating and letting them do all the talking because they're the experts in this field. Um, but today we're going to be first talking about design systems. Um, what are they? Why are they all the rage? Um, layout builder, uh, for those of you that are using it, great. Uh, for those of you that aren't. Um, then we're going to talk about collaboration, everyone's favorite topic, right? Everyone here loves their designers. All you designers love your developers, right? Um, and then last, we're going to be talking about kind of where do we go from here and what's next. Uh, but before we get into this, how many folks here can say that the project or projects that they're working on now actively have a design system? Okay, great. Nice. Um, that's more than I thought. Uh, and that's, that's good to see that, that folks are starting to adapt for this. And uh, for those that are using Layout Builder, how many folks are using Layout Builder? Awesome. Uh, how many folks are here to learn about Layout Builder and try to implement it? All right, so we got kind of a 50-50 folks learning how to implement a little better, and uh, we'll go through Layout Builder for those that aren't as familiar with it and how we end up using it. So with that, we're going to kick into design systems. Um, and so we're going to start it off super easy, super basic. The first question is, what is your definition of a design system? So there are many definitions of design systems out there, and you probably hear already some of them between the holes this week. I particularly have uh, kind of an odd definition uh, for me is your own certification process. Your team are going to be writing the rules and you have to follow those rules and be sure you are um, building the website that you need or your client needs and building with, with your team. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to kind of, yeah, basically add to that, you know, the, the concepts of it's the roadmap or it's the um, blueprint to building the sites or, or those kinds of concepts. And while, like, the structural part of that is for sure true, I think um, one of the things that I try to keep in mind, especially with the clients, is sort of the idea that it's a dictionary, right? Like, this is your tool to get across your ideas, right? And, and fundamentally capturing how that's going to work. And so, yeah. I tend to be more of the, the architectural nerd that like is thinking about the database and stuff and not so much about how it's going to look. So I kind of think in those terms. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a dictionary mixed with a Rosetta Stone that right. different people from different angles can all talk the same. So, um, so then as we're looking at the design systems that we are creating and interacting with, uh, one of the questions is how granular do you want to get with your design systems? Well, I think I'm very uh, specific. I like to go very specific on this. Uh, from your topography, your style, your headings, your paragraphs, the spacing you have between your components, um, and build from that. And I think from the Drupal point of view, it's very easy if your designers know how do we are building those things. Because if they base their designs on fields, like we do with Drupal, 
it's way more easier than <laughs> I've done. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was going to jokingly say subatomic, right? We're all familiar with atomic design, and I'm like, yeah, please, subatomic. Like, I, I, to me, I really think that the system needs to encapsulate everything that you're going to need to do, right? Um, and start from the ground up. And to your point, it, it, as we're building these out, it's every kind of minutia that needs to be shown on the, the front end needs to be captured somehow. Like, how is it? How does the the end user interact with it? How how does the editor interact with it? I mean, again, that I think that's often um, one of the parts of the design system that gets lost, which is your editors actually interact with this too, right? Like it's a translation layer for them as well, not just the designer. And we all know that Drupal has a great editor experience. Oh yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it takes some finesse, and that's yeah. and that's part of it. Is if you're making a design system to build the design. Um, it, within the website, you want to make it easy to use, right? And so you have to make those decisions on where do you use a field, where do you use a view mode to try to make that editor. Yeah, um, and frankly, uh, to me, uh, I, again, I'm, I tend to build the data architectures and the editor experience and kind of that aspect of it, and I, I, I rarely focus on sort of the end user's experience, but for me, the very strength of Drupal and its framework um, is that, where every client isn't gonna have the same editing experience, nor should they. Like, clients interact with their own information in their own heads differently. And so the framework of Drupal allowing you to say, hey, the editing of this particular component is slightly different between um, projects makes total sense, right? Honing it into the editors themselves. And the more specific you have your basics, the more consistent are going to be your components and it's gonna be easier for the users to build up things. Right, because you never get a component that looks like another one except for a green button instead of a red button, right? Right, right. yeah, exactly. That's the captured at the lower end so that as you're building up, you have consistency across the stack. And again, right. that, to me, that <laughs> simplifies the editing experience and it simplifies yeah. how much I have to save in the database so that I'm not, comp you know, I'm yeah. not creating 45 components, I'm creating 15 that are interusable. Right, right. So then, um, where do you start when you, when you begin to build a design system? How do you start one? <laughs> I know you, you guys both come out from different angles. Totally. You're the technical side, <laughs> you have more of the design in the front end, so it'd be interesting yeah. to see how do you both approach yeah, the beginning my, of a design system. My background is more a designer. Seven years ago, I was the designer leading a, a team and we hired um, somebody to build our website. Uh, and I usually start my design system from the designs or, or from some requirements that you talk with your uh, stakeholders mm -hmm. and you say like, we want this to be our design system. But uh, today, um, we, we know that this should not be. Um, Six years ago, we were talking about uh, content, uh, content first mm -hmm. uh, webs, uh, but I think it's not, it's not the case in most of our uh, projects, right? Right. We never think about the content uh, or why are we, why are we doing this? What, right. what do we want to communicate? And that should be the starting point. Right, and generally, yeah, exactly. Like I'm coming from the exact. I guess opposite direction, but with the same philosophy, which is weirdly my brain when I start seeing designs or figmas, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, great. Where's that gonna get saved and how is the editor gonna interact with it, right? I'm thinking content, I'm thinking, okay, cool. I, oh, there's an image and there's a button and there's a setting and that one's blue and you know, like I'm thinking in those terms and it's the exact, essentially opposite direction, but it's the exact same concept, content first. Like what are they trying to say and how do we make that happen? Right. So then, what is one tip to keep in mind when you're, you're starting to build and create your own design system? If you could distill it all down into just one tip. <laughs> keep, I think keep up in the conversation between mm -hmm. designers, developers, and right. stakeholders. Um, yeah, I think this shouldn't be one person leading or handling the, the design system, it should be all of the team and own it. It's our tool and we need to work on this tool every day. 
Do I have to limit it to one? Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess if, yeah, I think the, f the most important things would be, would be that. It would be, again, going back to the, the content first, right? Um, there are other tips. I, I'm, gonna, I gotta, I'm throwing more out there. Um, <laughs> atomic design really is your friend. Like, fundamentally understand the reusability of um, design concepts, right? Um, and real quick, are most folks familiar with atomic design and the concepts behind it? I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. Cool. And, and since, yeah, since we're all familiar here, then I guess the statement to that would be make your clients aware of what that means. It, it's really fundamentally um, like crucial that the editors and the folks trying to actually get the message out understand that concept too. Because as when we get into Layout Builder, we're kind of cover like how that concept actually translates into how they'll use Layout Builder. Um, but anyway, yeah. For me, this should be like a Lego. I don't know, it's the best example I can think of. It's uh, a set of pieces that is limited to, to a small amount of pieces and you build things from there. This is why we get along, because we <laughs> like playing with Legos. <laughs> yes. Great, well let's start diving into the Layout Builder then. Um, and, uh, and so, first off, um, why are you using Layout Builder and not Paragraphs? What's, what's, the, what's the drive there for you? Okay, um, I, I love paragraphs, so but. for those who love paragraphs here, I, um, yeah, uh, forgive me, but I, I, I really love paragraphs. I loved what it represented. Um, mm -hmm. And it really drove a lot of people towards thinking of component-driven. For sure. And atomic yeah. design. Yeah, for sure. It, I, to me, yeah, it was like that first tool to really start capturing the concepts of atom atomic design and components and things. Um, Obviously, we know the performance woes of paragraphs and revisions and all of that. I think uh, hopefully folks are kind of familiar with that. Anybody need an explanation of that? I can give you kind of a dissertation after the, <laughs> after the session. But um, really, in my, my mind, again, especially from the content editor aspect and then trying to translate into the design system sort of the visual is um, the flexibility that the layout builder gives you to truly go atomic, right? Like to truly get down to what is the smallest thing to communicate the message I have that I need to put on the page. And then with that library, how can I better make my communication, <laughs> right? Give me the tools, the Legos to play with to put them in there. And I think layout builder really fundamentally grasps that at its core. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add there. I know the, the, the database and the issues that Paragraph have um, are more evident for large websites. Maybe if you have a small website, it's okay to use Paragraph for you. And, and we have built a mm -hmm. uh, website with Paragraph for years, uh, mostly in Drupal 7. We have a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was fine. It was more than fine. Um, but yeah, I yeah I mean I guess that yeah so if uh, still have clients that are like very micro brochure sites right so for them maybe conceptually for their mental model of you know I want to put content on the page so I'm going to put this thing that lets me put an image and some text or uh, a table and a video or whatever like and 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 a very simplistic um, kind of row by row yeah design. and that sometimes that's a little easier to grok um, as like a, a new new person really using the web basically, but if you can really get the concept of here's a box of Legos and here's a tool to be able to lay them out and, and convey the message you want, then it really gives them the freedom to start thinking differently about what they're actually doing with their information. And so, yeah, I, smaller sites maybe, but even then I think I, I would still drive towards a layout builder approach, even if it's simplistic. Great, so then, um, how do you use Layout Builder and the concepts within Layout Builder to drive and help your design system? I, I can, yeah, I can go, go with that. <laughs> so for me, the most important thing is you are separating the grid system from your components. So I want to, when I start with Layout Builder, I want to um, <clears throat> set what are my rules for my grid and what are going to be my components or my basic components. Because you probably want to start with 
four components or six components, and this is gonna grow. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as a starting point, and these are the concepts, of course, that when you start to get into design systems and layout builder implementation, is you have your your information, the thing that your 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 clients trying to get across as an information piece, but that's often or should be separated from how that's getting laid out on the page, right? That's the flexibility of Layout Builder. So, um, uh, I guess it's just help, yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah. I, I guess it just boils down to, again, Layout Builder to me, right. fundamentally grasp the idea of, <laughs> here's your content separate from your layout and you can move it around, place it here, do some settings, um, and get your, your info across. And that's because you're not just working in four, right. like full horizontals. You can right. break it into a component lives within the region or the, right. the portion of the page that is in that, that section, um, but you, you're not building these big monolithic rows anymore. Yeah, it gives a lot of flexibility to your content editors and mm -hmm. marketing teams. And that's a really, actually, uh, from a conceptual standpoint, that's a huge one to get across, which uh, in the paragraphs days, um, because you were kind of limited to these bands, you theoretically could create a band that was a layout and then have ad hoc things you can place in there, but you didn't often do that and you didn't often want to do that. With Layout Builder, you're separating your actual content. So for instance, if I'm going to create a component that allows for an image and some text, that would be a paragraph, right? And you may have another paragraph that's a two column that, that um, lets, you know, maybe different entities or, or, or um, different data structures, and you would, you even though you may repeat like the text block in each of those, you would have to repeat that in the paragraphs because your folding states and how it collapses and all of that is dependent on that row. Whereas in Layout Builder, you look at that, you're like, oh, okay, that's a text block and I'm using it in six different places. Well, I only have to build that once. I only even have to ke conceptualize that once, right? Not six different ways because of how it all folds down. That's a, that's a pretty fundamental concept of the difference there. So then that's a great uh, transition into um, how has Layout Builder um, changed your approach to site building? <laughs> and um, really, that's, to me, yeah, fundamentally, to me, it finally allowed me to capture the concept of content first. And the content is what you're going for, and the content is what you're building for. It's the separation of the layouts. Anatomic design. Right. Yeah, yes. yeah, and it's the separation of, yeah, 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 that's great. I, I can do two columns and three columns and all these different, you know, which side does it go on and how does it collapse? But, but to me, that's almost ancillary to the data that you're trying to present. And that's, for me, Layout Builder, that was one of the biggest mental shifts I was able to finally make when I pulled myself out of paragraphs. And I think that is the magic. You, you, we didn't think we were conceptually changer, changing our website we change with the technology. I right. Think. Yeah, and if you um, compare and contrast, I know I had a, a joke in there earlier of it being Drupal's Gutenberg, but um, if, for those of you that have used the WordPress uh, Gutenberg, um, it's a brilliant way to um, get content onto the screen. Um, it, it flows with how you think, it's uh, intuitive, um, but the hardest part that I have with it is the data structure behind it, because there, there's not a lot of data structure. Um, and Layout Builder, I think, kind of gives you that blend of usability um, while still retaining control over the architecture and the data. Right, and that's also another concept that becomes really useful is the reusability is the, the data architecture and the technical debt that comes from that, um, especially um, building everything as a band, so you have to repeat stuff and you have to repeat fields and your, your technical debt to maintain all of that becomes huge. E like, even really, really, really big sites you can limit what you're actually building down quite a bit. It's a, it's, it's a much smaller subset, especially as you decouple layout from content. Yeah, I think we haven't talked about this, but you should be thinking on your content structure when you are creating those components. For sure. Because you someday you're gonna need to migrate this website or uh, change the whole a structure of the website and you have a bunch of content and different types of content in, in different product pages and you you won't be able to move that 
anywhere. Yeah, that and again, as you can hone down the the actual components you're building, the technical debt of okay, new requirement. It's been updated in the design system. You know, client says I want X Y Z. That that actually requires sort of like a fundamental change to the data. It's a lot easier to have one or two of those you're having to deal with and then verify than it is to have six or ten or whatever, right? And and having to like programmatically adjust for each um, variation of that. Um, that. I think that also helps as well. So this is one that um, Jonathan and I continually go back and forth on <laughs> uh, as, we're, as we're architecting. And, and again, uh, why a lot of the times they like to push me out of that role uh, in projects because uh, uh, we go back and forth on um, how heavy do you leverage CK Editor? And I know that we're getting CK Editor 5 in, in Drupal 10 and it's gonna be awesome and there's so many cool features to it, right? Um, so where do you draw that line between I'm creating a block or I'm going to be using CK Editor? Or how do you draw that line? Or do you draw that line? <laughs> My personal approach is I like to use blocks and fields and have all my content well structured. But I know uh, content editors, they, they don't like that. They don't like to be a square. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's that... It's that loggerhead of like, I want total flexibility and I can do whatever I want. And then there's the, yeah, but I want structured data and this thing should make sense elsewhere. Um, yeah, for me, I've gotten to, I, I, I love CK Editor, but in my mind, the editor should be sort of what it sounds like. It should be for editing copy, in my opinion. And in the editor, you should provide tools for doing copy copy styles, um, structured copy, an H2 followed by a paragraph by an H3, that, you know, like actual structured information, properly structured information. Um, but basically anything outside of that, the embedding of imagery or other entities or that kind of information, I try to keep completely out of the CK editor. Um, with, of course, the caveats of the, the really hard of like, I have this really random layout where I'm dropping in random media objects and the text should flow around them, but it's like two thirds and one third and you know, that stuff gets a little more complicated. But I, I would rather build that one little special animal as a component than have any media or um, entities within CK Editor. But I, I think it depends on your website because if you have a blog, <laughs> probably gonna be, make sense to have the image embed on your text and that's okay to have on, on your blog, blog pages, but... Yeah, I think, it, again, th the simplicity of what you're trying to communicate and the simplicity of the site. I mean, we've run repeatedly into issues with using very well-established embedding tools and having them break over time. And unfortunately, the, the biggest problem with that is you have markup in your database, essentially, and that is what goes wrong. Like, your data attribute between version one and version three has suddenly changed and now you have to scrub everything, right? Or it completely breaks. And we have several fairly large sites that really highly depend on embedding um, media or other entities within the CK editor and they're almost constantly a struggle. Um, and so those are the types of things that I, I personally try to avoid, even from a mental model. Again, editors, like structured content. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm not doing media. And, and it also depends on on the ability or the skills of your content creators or For your sure. content editors. Yeah. If they're advanced uh, editors or, or just beginners, uh, they, they, could help, they could help you in the process to clean up this markup or, or not. Right, right. So then, um, similar to what we went through before, um, if you had uh, one thing that you wish you knew before you started using Layout Builder and started designing with it, uh, for those that are in the room that haven't used it, what would you give them as your um, the one thing that you wish you knew before starting. Sorry, I'm stumping you on a, well, <laughs> on a Thursday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I guess for me, the answer that I was coming up with, I don't know if it really encapsulates the biggest one thing, but the, the thing that strikes me nowadays in most of our projects is the concept of like content first, um, component driven, X, fill in the blank, component-driven content, component-driven design, right? That whole stack is all coupled together tightly. And so 
the biggest stru uh, struggle we have is getting everybody involved on that same mental note, even, even your stakeholders, even the, hey, I wanna do X, Y, and Z, and often when they're given a design, and I think maybe this is just how people have fallen to, it's, they're seeing these bands or they're seeing these big chunks of like, well, that's called latest news, and it has these different cards here and these smaller ones here and that line there, and, and so they see it uh, holistically when you really want them to start conceptualizing that card, that individual card, or that heading and the tools you can do in that heading and what you can change. So for me, I, I really wish I would have known how difficult it is to convey that because <laughs> I still struggle with trying to you know, figure out how to actually communicate that to people. Yeah, today we spend a lot of time sitting with our clients having those conversations. And at, at the beginning you, you make this, I have option A, option B, option C, and give the decision making to the client. And they will choose whatever they think is better, but they usually don't have the information to make that decision. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. They just make it on the air. Right. There you go. Well, that brings up uh, our favorite topic, as I was mentioning, all you designers in the room love your developers, and all your developers love your designers. Um, so when it comes to collaboration, um, how do design systems help with that collaboration in your mind? So once you have is established this system and you have your agile methodology around it and you make your uh, scrum sessions and you uh, start making decisions about like, okay, we have a new component and we need to do this and you ask them, do, do you really need a new one? Can we use this component? And that speed up the conversation like to the moon. It's yeah, I would, I would say as I listen in on calls that they're on with <laughs> folks as we're building out design systems, it almost feels like you're negotiating oh, for sure. with design yeah. through the design system. It's right. the method by which you're negotiating. Right. But do we really want that to be a new button or can we use this button and right. pull this here? And those kind of conversations um, couldn't I think be facilitated actually, without I, that. I had a whole list of things I was going to kind of add on this one. And I, <laughs> after hearing that, it really is, to me, the biggest takeaway is ambiguity. Like, properly built out design system that everybody follows from the stakeholder to the back end developer and everybody in between, it really reduces confusion and it reduces redundancies. Um, the, yeah, working with designers that maybe aren't fully grasping the idea of truly component and so again, everything becomes a bigger, a bigger object on the page and you're like, but that card, it's a card, has all the same information, looks 99% identical, but it has one little tweak. And you're like, eh, really? Yeah. If you are in a meeting, if you are um, going through these new designs and you don't have a design system that you, you can see and everybody in the meeting can see at the time, you are asking like, oh, well, but we have this blah, 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 blah here. And, and, and I don't see that we are making a big change with this new component. Right. And, and if you don't have the design system there, most of the people in the meeting, they, they don't have that visualization of the whole right. thing. Right, you, your conversations very quickly get mired with, well, we have that, right? Like if you did this one thing and you flip that one switch, it looks like this, right? And there's a lot of that like <laughs> back and forth and you know, the, the developer's like, yes, I know I built that. I remember seeing it, right? And, and sometimes the designer's like, hey, look, I made this completely new component. It's like, eh, it's not really. And, and, and you'll spend 30 minutes on just that conversation. And if you don't have your naming, the, the naming of your well, yes. components. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, Back across to the idea the, of it being a dictionary. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you are talking about the Fisher uh, part, right, and right, the other guy right. is talking about the lining card. And, and why is everything called a card? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, they are. <laughs> so then um, that brings up a great question of who actually owns the design system? Is it the designer? <laughs> is it the developers? Who should own the design I system? I do. <laughs> no. Um, can you go first? Because, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think the whole team has to own this, this shit, they, they, sorry, <laughs> I should not be say that. <laughs> so I think everybody on the team has be, uh, to be uh, involved in the process, yeah. Right. Uh, they all have to, to own it, they all have to feel they 
can change it. They can modify the, the things right. in there and, and improve them. Yeah, I, I mean, joking aside, it, it, if, you, if you're trying not to get on meetings with 35 people and they all have ownership of the design system, I get those conversations. But frankly, the ownership of the design system has to be the client, the designer, the front-end developer, and the back-end developers, and the content strategist. Like, they all have to sign off on it because, again, what you're fundamentally building is, hey, I'm a client and I have something I'm trying to message to people. How do I get it on the page, right? Everybody has to agree you know, what am I trying to say? How am I going to, how am I going to say it? What are the, the, what's my editing experience with that? Like we run into, we have several where it's like either being driven from the, the back end, which is like, this is the easiest data structure. Here you go. And the front end's like, I can't even use that. On the flip side, you have the designers that are like, everything is a new component. And the back end's going like, whoa, wait a second. Now we have this thing that has 45 options. Is that really necessary? So it needs to be collaborative. So how really do you keep does. that in line? The, well, the design system to begin with, right. but then you, you, as far as like, like data structure and all that, you, you couple that with a properly built spec sheet, which is that the next well, slide. Uh, hey, we look just at happen that. to have an example of one. Um, so how, how do you use a spec sheet like this to, to drive your design systems and the ownership of it? So generally speaking, this is more like the data architecture's playground, um, but I don't know if folks have seen this. Um, this is widely available. Acquia provides this. Thank you, Acquia. Um, it's a uh, go grab it, and they keep it up to date with new functionality. But um, I've added some new functionality, which I might talk to Acquia folks that I see in the room someday. Um, but basically, the concept is, as you can see, it's just a spreadsheet. And, and we try to tightly couple, you know, um, where, where are we getting the concept of what we're building? What is the naming of that thing? What does it do? What is the front end component called, right? How do we, how are we coupling the back end editable ability to the front end? And, and then we just capture it literally. This would be truly more of a blueprint. This is the nuts and bolts of what you're building. But this comes after that design system is completely built, right? And the concepts are identified. And it's on a place where everybody can access at any time and, and uh, solve their questions about, oh, do we have this already? Do we have something that is similar that, or uh, what do we want to build? Right. And when you're having those discussions of we're creating a new thing and we're in the design system and we're talking about how this card is slightly different than that card, this is a good way to then come back to saying, okay, here's the tools on the editing side that we already have available to us to then um, leverage over here without reusing. Again, um, you know, field underscore title should basically act the same anywhere it is on the site. Um, again, so that's also a mental model for your editors. They know to expect field title does this and not like wildly diverge in what it actually does. Yeah, and for folks that are building decoupled sites, um, a spec sheet like this that goes all the way down to the machine name um, basically becomes your guidebook for the API, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know how to interact with it because you know what fields you're looking for. Um, and as you're building things out, it becomes that, that central point that all decisions are, are finalized in. Yeah, and that's something we'll get to later. But yeah, the, the, this also outlines the ability for this to be not just, okay, I'm putting this in Twig. Like, where else is this going? And it, it helps a lot to keep consistent naming yeah. because yeah. you see all the things here. Yeah, I think we all agree on that. Naming is hard, I've, I've heard. <laughs> So then, uh, how often are you updating your design systems? <laughs> Go. Every day, every <laughs> single day. Every meeting we have, every, every component you are building, every time you open a ticket and you go to the spec sheet and you check all your fields are in there or, or not. Maybe you have your designs, your comps here on your ticket and then you go to the spec sheet and you say like, oh, this is not here, or this is something, I, I don't know, it should be a field or it's just a static content. And we go over uh, to our team meeting and ask, is this static content, right. is okay? If we have the same word over and over, or you need a field that it has a dummy content that is gonna be like default, and then you can uh, config that field if you need to. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the hard and fast rule that I try to use is that are you changing anything in how this is getting communicated? I mean, anything. So um, if it's like 
purely an editor experience change request from the client where they don't like a drop down and they want something, that doesn't affect the design system or really the end product of the communication, right? So those obviously you probably aren't putting those in your design system, that's where the spec sheet comes in handy. But any kind of change that, that changes content or the, the ability to display that content, it, like, it's the entry. You start with the design system. So then, um, as we're getting into the final minutes here, again, um, informal conversation. If you want to raise your hand and ask a question at any time, just please do so. Um, but now let's start looking into the crystal ball and saying what's next. Where, where do we go now that we know these designs? Oh, yes, there's a question? No? OK, sorry. Um, uh, so now that we know how we're kind of building these design systems, how we're layering it in with Layout Builder, um, what is the uh, one feature that you'd like to see added uh, to Layout Builder? I'm, I'm going for the content editor experience here uh, because I'm always looking into how content, uh, how editors are experiencing this thing. And I would love to have a zoom in, zoom out, and kind of a mobile, mobile version mm -hmm. uh, preview because it's true, you can move things up and down with Layout Builder, but sometimes these layouts, they grow so fast. Mm -hmm. There is, you cannot have all in, in one screen. Mm -hmm. So I would like to have like zoom out and I have all my components, just the squares, probably mm -hmm. not that many detail on it, and just move them around. I hadn't thought about that. That is a very good feature. Yeah, yeah, that I think, yeah. The, from the editing experience, that would be an amazing feature. Um, what was I going to say? From the back end or the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is so mighty again. Yeah, data. Uh, I think the biggest feature that I would like to see would be context-aware blocks. Um, basically, running into kind of some issues where um, theme switching on a particular content type and mm -hmm. context of what the content type is and context of where it is... Uh, I would love to see, and you know, this may end up like exploding um, the data layer, but some ability to say, okay, I'm this type of block, that's my parent, and these are my siblings. And that, then you can really start leveraging um, uh, like web components and um, APIs and that kind of stuff to, to display the information because that block already has all the data it needs to know who it is and where it's at. Um, I, that, that, that would be one that would be important, although I think that one totally trumps what I was going to say. So. No, no, we, we have tried to do, we have tried to do No, no I want that one first. I totally yeah. agree. <laughs> That's a really good I think good for one. me, one of the ones that I, um, I, I think there's an issue for it and there, there's some back and forth on, on how it's going to uh, end up being uh, implemented, but the idea of global blocks versus local blocks yeah. and how do I take a local block, make it global, Take a global, make a copy, bring it local, right? How do you how do you interact with that? I think again, um, I've seen some page builders for WordPress and others that have that concept kind of drilled down really easily, where you have kind of template blocks, where it's a global block, you can add it in, but as soon as you change a word, it becomes a local block, and you're not constantly dealing with this, you know, which one's global, which yeah. one's local. I changed it here, and oh crap, now. And using the, the libraries, like you know, we have the the a really not the media library, which is wonderful, and obviously the content table, which is essentially a drillable library and stuff. And I think really having that work with your reusable components so that somebody can say, you know, I made this card, and like, wow, okay, I really like that, and it's pretty neutral, and I can use it all over. Great, make that reusable. Now it's going to show up in, in that table so that then later on they can go right. to the table and go, actually, I want to tweak that a little, and I know it's going to affect all of them. Th right. That would be great. I'm sorry we are speaking too fast because mm -hmm. I think uh, this concept of a global component or a local component cannot be can not be familiar for everyone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, is there anybody familiar? Everybody here familiar with or any have questions about inline blocks versus reusable blocks? And yep, looks like folks are. No. I saw there was one question in the back. Yeah. I Yeah. Yep. Uh, we we don't have any uh, screenshots that we'll we'll kind of dive into on that, but yeah, I think out of the box, um, that's a great question. Like, what are some of the modules that you use 
day in and day out with Layout Builder in order to, to shape that, oh, that editing experience. I'd have to look at the site. Um, a Layout Builder, Modal, and... The ecosystem, Layout Builder ecosystem yeah. website in Drupal org. Yeah, and um, section libraries and um, uh, some of the, uh, played around with some of like the bootstrap style, um, like pre-configured um, settings for the blocks, that sort of thing. Um, but I mean, to the question, we're kind of almost constantly <laughs> tweaking. It, we both yeah. tend to off, often agree as well on like the editing experience. And so if the budget and the time allows, we're always sort of trying to make that better. So there's a fair bit of customization, especially in conjunction with the theme, the back end theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that the, the contributors are been working on this experience a lot last years and they haven't finally found the, the, the recipe to mm -hmm. make it like perfect. It's not perfect. It's still a bunch of work there to, to contribute with. But yeah, sometimes we put some hours, some energy into little details to make it easier for the content editors to Actually, access the bottom or the yeah. editing. I think that would make a really good bot that's like four hours long of like, you know, layout builder show and tell, hey, I did this cool thing, look how that works, right? Like, because th th there's a lot of folks in the room, right. a lot of folks playing with different aspects. That would actually kind of be fun. And so um, we've got time for maybe one more question and then if there's any questions out there as well. But um, this one's kind of the fun one for me. Uh, I've been playing around with this concept lately is, um, do you think in the future we're gonna see hybrid themes, themes that work on WordPress, Drupal, um, you name it, Gatsby, the rest. We should. We should be able to speed up uh, atomic design driven themes that can work for. Yeah, I, and, and we've chatted this and we've looked at different implementations, but I would, yeah, I, I think that's for sure the future. Um, and I think, again, as more and more agencies, especially the larger ones, adopt their design systems and they have sort of a unified language to get things across, what you can see is um, where the applications are similar, you can sort of couple them a bit at a certain layer, like the fundamental structure of a card in Twig can be similar in WordPress as it is in Drupal. And that, that layer can be maintained in its own library, right? And then brought in um, into the web components to go specific Drupal, specific um, WordPress. And I think that, that kind of future full tail with the design system is actually going to be incredibly powerful. Yeah, it's been fun to see. We actually have a few sites that have um, kind of abstracted twig templates that come from outside of Drupal. Um, and so then you're, you're basically marrying the fields in Layout Builder uh, through Drupal's templating system to these kind of generic twig templates that can then be used all over the place. And that's where the, the kind of the spec sheet comes in because at that point, you have, you can then say, okay, great, now I'm gonna go create a WordPress version of that, and I already know what all of my variables on the front end are supposed to be called. So now all I'll have to do is hook up, okay, how am I gonna get that to them? And then with that, um, are there any questions or comments as we've been talking this whole time, and, and I've been uh, preparing these com uh, questions, but are there any from the crowd as well? Uh, yes, all the way against the wall there, and then we'll work our way back here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, I can get on a soapbox for 50 <laughs> minutes on just, on just layout builder versus Gutenberg. Uh, I love the WordPress community. I'm, I'm friends with a lot of folks there. Uh, I always, whenever I'm there, I always describe myself. I'm like, oh, I'm a Drupaler that's here. And finally, they had to tell me to stop and to say you're a WordPresser as well. Um, so I love it. I love the interaction of Gutenberg, the, the ease of use. I think that's what, as Drupal, and, and we're talking about kind of the editing experience and what we do to modify that, I think that's the direction and almost the beacon that we should be trying to go towards. There are some accessibility and usability issues of it, but then when you look in the back end, it just takes that all and just smashes it into the body field on a, on a blog post. And so there's zero structured data, and there's zero structured data in WordPress in general. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that I always look at when I say, am I going Drupal or am I going WordPress? It's, do I need structured data? If I'm just creating a brochure and I want somebody to have an easy experience or they're creating a blog, Gutenberg all day long. Um, but the moment that you want to start breaking things apart and then reusing that structure, that data elsewhere, it just falls, it starts to fall apart. And then you're tacking on so many plugins to make Gutenberg right. do that that you've just built Drupal through plugins. So 
Yeah, um, it's I think just not worth it. For me, it, it, yeah, it comes back to that structured data concept. And so it limits the flexibility of, like, if you're building a website right. and, and it's simplistic or not simplistic, whatever, if, if you're just building a website, that, that can make sense. It makes a really great editor experience. But you're getting blobs, right? If you're trying to build a communication platform where it'll get used in other places, right. then you need that structured data. Uh, next question here. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do know the layout. I'm sorry if I missed it, but um, you seem to be referring to layout builder versus paragraph visual or binary source. Right. Uh, we use layout paragraph. Right. Um, which combine both of those things to be able to adapt to both worlds. I'm right. Trying to figure out why it's necessary to say one or the other because it's having the paragraphs allowed us to also control you know, which which block that was being put to which and giving multiple clicks to certain things in certain places. Right. Right. One thing would be equivalent to a paragraph, and that paragraph could then be used within a two-column layout, but not in a three-column layout. Right. Yeah, I think um, which we're like constantly battling that one. So yeah, I don't. It's not necessarily an either-or. I think um, fundamentally we're able to tackle those exact problems just directly within Layout Builder native, and you know blocks like using fundamental native Drupal concepts. There are add-ons, for instance. Uh, and to the point back there, layout builder restrictions, where you're right. like, three columns, that component can never go there. Like, And right. you can get more sophisticated with that with, um, there are like restrictions by role, and there's those types of things. So you can get very sophisticated in like where your editors can place things. And so for me, when, I, when I'm looking at how I'm gonna build that structure, you know, starting with the design system, you have your concept of these components already. <laughs> I don't wanna get mired down in yet another main maintenance um, tool that I have, or even a, a, a data structure maintenance, right? If I'm using blocks throughout, right. then structurally I'm using blocks throughout. And oh, totally, yeah. yeah. So, I'll, yeah, I'll be the I'll be the controversial one and say I have I have no reason for paragraphs ever again, um, and I'm totally open to my mind being changed on that. But um, if you dive in at the, I mean, at the heart of it, an entity is an entity is an entity, right? Um, and that's kind of the beauty of Drupal is that everything is an entity and it's all fieldable. Um, but I've, I've found that using blocks and, and how blocks are so core to what Drupal is, um, all of the tests, everything just work on blocks. Yeah. Um, nice. and, and again, kind of we're at times in, the, in some of the paragraph sites, we were kind of pushing the boundaries of where paragraphs was at. And you could see that it was not a core entity. Like there are certain aspects of it that just hadn't been um, thought of, and there, I would say, and, and again, I'm totally fine being proven wrong here. I don't see anything that would happen in paragraphs that I couldn't also do with blocks. And so, so to me, then I'm having to maintain two things, uh, going back to the maintenance thing, and it just becomes a hassle for me. So, so basically, in paragraphs, you have entities inside entities inside entities. Right. That could happen with blocks too. You can end up building right. uh, columns inside a block inside of a, a tab component. Right. But it, the more simple you keep the things, they're gonna be easier to handle um, draft edition or publish content right. workflows yeah. or translation. Actually, yeah, that's, that's that something I wanted one to bring up ran too. Into was the, the entity revision. An entity revisions yeah. and stuff that, that Paragraphs is going through. Again, it, it kind of being not core. Um, we found certain situations, especially in like a decoupled um, website where the revision of the parent didn't boil down to the um, subparagraph because whenever we were building in paragraphs, it was like a paragraph and a paragraph and a paragraph and a paragraph and a paragraph in order to get the atomic design that we wanted. And so then um, you end up running into these uh, entity revision. Um, entity stuff. revision requests don't work with all entities. And it's right. at this point pretty limited to core specific entities. Yeah. Um, especially in a decoupled site. Yeah. So. We have one over here, and then we'll we'll come down here, and then I think that'll be our time. Yes. Yeah, my question is sort of a practical procedural question um, with regard to design and, and, and data structure and content structure. Um, so, so when I'm new to sort of using the layout builder tool, does does the layout builder help solve the problem of your very structured content being full of of pieces that are actually not Content. I see a lot of content sites that have, you know, 10 pages of 
Right. Like, is blue, is green, is yeah. checkbox, is radio, right? Like, it ends up just being a bunch of fields that are not even data, like, not even content. It's just right. how to manipulate it. I think Jonathan, the way that he uses view modes, I'll, I'll prop him up on this. The way he uses view modes in that takes all that away because then you just are creating view modes for that block and you just have them select, again, going back as the design system as the reference, I want the small card, I want the big card, I want the horizontal card, yeah. horizontal card. And that, because you know the context of it from your design system, all you're doing is you're creating a, now a new template within um, your theme and it, it has those um, pieces pre-baked in. It doesn't give you the checkbox where you can create like you know, 10,000 configurations from those fields. But again, going back to the design system, you almost don't want that, right? You don't want somebody to, to um, and then you have to write, start writing custom right. logic of like, you can never have a red button next to the green eyebrow. And that's, and actually another part of that, which is that whole context aware block and yeah. sections and things. Um, the, the other strength there is you don't have to have a setting for turn my text white, <laughs> right? If you're context aware and your design system's built properly, when I place this section and I turn the background dark, I want my text light, that's context. That, you, don't, you don't need your editors to mess with that. The design system should be accounting for that, right? So in, in that way, for sure, it, it helps a lot. We, we start removing things like um, the content creator being able to change the sp spacing between one component and another component. Mm -hmm. That should not be a decision for the content editor. It should be part of the design system. Right. It should look good all the times. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, one last question here. Yeah, more of a adding to what Chris is saying. So layout versus paragraph, that would be a long discussion. Uh, the original idea of layout uh, was to do what paragraph, what people were trying to do with paragraph in a more controlled way and in a beautiful way that integrates better with better performance. Uh, at the time, we would be seeing databases of 10 gigabytes mm -hmm. where six of those were two paragraphs for each page. Right. Yeah. And when you go to MySQL, it doesn't matter if you're looking at that table. That just doubles the time to get that information. Yeah, right. Even yeah. If you're not just looking at a, pa at a paragraph. We have a site right now that's 80 gigabytes in the database, yeah. and it's, it's made mostly of paragraphs, and it's huge. And to go as an example of what Chris was saying, the reason for that was uh, that got fixed two or three years ago, but it was a big endeavor. Uh, right. One yeah. of my customers paid for part of that. Uh, I'm very aware. Was deleting a revision, changing a revision, or deleting something, it was hard to get to the actual paragraph, front of the paragraph, that had the paragraph, beside the paragraph, mm -hmm. along with the paragraph, and get all those revisions done. Right. Uh, at some point with a customer, I, I, I tried to do some SQL to get our fund revision. Right. It was immediate. Right. So that, that was the idea. Now, with that said, many people have been invested in paragraphs. Right. It's not a dead ecosystem by no. any means. And for folks that are building on it, um, that's, you know, that's, that's totally legit as well. So I don't mean to be like, yeah. if you're doing it, you're doing it wrong. It's more just, as I'm looking at it now, I, I now, I've been building Drupal for 12 plus years now, and I, I used to do these like wild and crazy builds, and now it's like as simple as possible. If I can create one thing, and then place that one thing 30 different places or whatever, oh, yeah. I'm awesome. And if but I can it, use yeah. Drupal native as much as yeah. possible. And I'm not maintaining a large core, so. To finish my point, I think uh, layout paragraph is fantastic for those that want to move away right. as a transition, because yeah, I mean, we're invested, paragraph is really good as well as that, and really bad as well as that at the same time. Right. Uh, my advice, I'm, I'm a family last year, is to my customers is always, if you can, use this stuff to walk away of something that is not well integrated within Drupal, because A, eventually you're gonna have issues maintaining Right. And B is going to come back and bite you at some point. Yeah. Because you cannot enhance it, or you cannot improve it in terms of reliability, speed, etc. You end up going out of more web traction. And oh, I think you had one to say, give your users freedom, but they don't, don't give them that much freedom. That's yeah. what this entire system works for. 
So we're we're about five minutes over. Uh, I want to you know respect your guys' time, and I appreciate you, again making the trek out last day, last session, uh, coming out. If you have any questions, um, feel free to write us an email. Come up and talk to us. If you want to change my mind on paragraphs, I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you.